Rising stock prices will have more Americans picking their feet. Rising stock prices means that more Americans will be picking at their toes? More Americans will be picking their feet with devices such as this oh. as stock prices rise. Giddy up. Welcome to The Knock-On Effect, the show that starts with the thing you know and ends up, here you go, in a strange place. I'm Alex Rosenberg, joined as always by everyone's top pick, the co-host of the Mo-Host, Justine Underhill. Thank you. You're welcome. And by the man who always lands on his feet, our historical oracle, the professor himself, Roger Hurst. Thanks very much, Alex. All right. So after today's main segment, uh, Justine's going to tell us about a number that rarely shows up in earnings reports in our new segment, What's Your Number? Uh, but first, Justine, Roger and I are going to try to get you from rising stock prices to people using using these things. This looks a little bit like intense or like an industrial thing to use on your foot. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll learn all about it, and, and we're going to try to get you from, from there to here. With that being said, would you like to hazard a early guess? Why rising stock prices? Yes. Okay. Uh, rising stock prices means that people will feel more wealthy, um, Great. and so they will start investing in maybe themselves and in new, new things, and so maybe um, they start realizing that their, their feet are dirty, so they use uh, foot picks. This makes no sense to me. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, would you give that a, a grade, oh, Roger? No. Well, I think it's fair to say, Justine, that you were really yes. fumbling around in the dark there. So uh, at this stage, I don't think you've even got a basic yes, I was, grade, I was grabbing at, at straws. Yes, uh, fair enough. Speaking of straws, uh, that's, a, that's a whole different knock-on effect with Starbucks. But um, So you, you are mistaken. Um, it's no secret that stock prices have been rising. So if you've owned stocks for the past nine years, good job. Um, I don't want to get into exactly why they've been rising. Definitely don't want to get into whether they'll continue to rise. Just want to sort of sort of set that off for now and move on to the first knock-on effect, which is income inequality. So, so Professor, I'll just a uh, bit of a leading the witness question, but if stock prices rise further, will the rich get even more so? I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. The top 1% of US citizens own 40% of all shares. The top 20% own 92% of all shares. And I think the middle class, so you know, the majority of Americans own only around about 8%. So I think it's very clear that if share prices are going up, it's a very small number who really benefit and therefore income inequality is only going to rise. And let's throw that into the mix with also that um, the CEOs at the largest companies earn 271 times more than the average employee at those companies. So really, this does show that income inequality from share prices. Right. I've, I was always surprised by the stat to find out like how many Americans don't own any stock or aren't invested in the stock market. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes intuitive sense, right? A lot of Americans don't have a lot of spare money. So if you have money to spare, you will might invest in the stock market. The more money you have to spare, the more you're going to invest in the market. The more the market goes up, the, right. the, the, the better it is. For the, I mean, it, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, reductive in a way because the stock market is also just ma measuring the profits that adhere to owners of capital. So it, it's sort of tautological. But if, if you just isolated a stock market rising in of itself, you would say that if you looked at a country, let's, let's say Fredonia's stock market has risen for the past 10 years, it's probably been good news for Fredonia's rich, and it's been probably meant a widening of income inequality. Yes. I mean, you would think that as, as stock prices went up, maybe companies might pass some of those gains on to the workers, but that hasn't necessarily been the case. It, it certainly hasn't. And, and In terms for, of wage increases. And Roger, you have some interesting stats about what's happened to both stocks and income inequality in the United States since the late 70s. In fact, we have seen this incredible imbalance, this great inequality, really picking up since the 1970s, and it is largely to do with shares. And I think the big giveaway here is that it really kicked off in 1982. And this was the beginning of the great uh, bull market in US equities. So from 1982, maybe even till today, we've seen this inequality only get wider and wider. Obviously, that's being driven or partly driven by the shares and the uh, amount of equity that the rich people own. But also, we've seen a suppression of wages. And some would argue that we've seen this massive increase in the C-suite pay and this uh, maintenance of high levels of profit margin, largely at the expense of workers. Their wages have fallen or at least 
stayed static in real terms whilst the C-suite have paid themselves more and more and more and more in shares, and those shares have gone up at a faster pace than GDP, giving them this absolute boon benefit uh, that, the, that the rich have gained over the average worker. Right. And, and just I'd be remiss if we didn't mention the Fed here at, at some point, um, because higher stock prices to produce more wealth for the wealthy has actually been seen arguably a, as a policy goal. So I'm going to read going way back in time to 2010 um, when Fed Chair Ben Bernanke, then Fed Chair, of course, uh, wrote in a two, 2010 Washington Post op-ed, and I quote, higher stock prices will boost consumer wealth and will help increase confidence, which can also spur spending. Increased spending will lead to higher incomes and profits that, in a virtual circle, will further support economic expansion. And that's one of the biggest complaints about the Fed, or yeah, one of them, which is that it does, uh, in some ways, increase income inequality. So he's not targeting income inequality, obviously, right, and, right. and the Fed has talked about income inequality and the, the issues with that. But if you target higher stock prices, you are going to encourage income inequality. Right, or just even the process of quantitative easing, how that works, how it goes to the banks, how everything, the whole policy works, also kind of exacerbates that issue. Yeah, it, ab absolutely. Um, now, is it still the best policy goal? Is it is it worthy enough that it's worth the extra income inequality? That's a whole thing I don't want to get into. Instead, I want to talk about pets. Pets? Yes, pets. Those things that millennials love instead of children. So according oh. to a 2017-2018 uh, st uh, study done by the American Pet Products Association, more than half of American households have a pet, uh, the most popular being dogs, followed by cats, birds, uh, kind of goes down from there. As a fellow millennial, do you have a pet? You know, I'm 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 sadly there's a sad situation. I'm between pets now, but I <laughs> probably will have a cat or two soon. Okay. Do you do you have any pets? No, I am part of the other fifty percent of millennials that yeah. don't have a pet. Yes. So so we could talk about. I have succulents. Those are my pets. Don't care. <laughs> those are plants, right? For, the, for those at home. But they are my babies. What are their their names? Um, Harris and Teeter. Did you just make that up? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, that, that's relieving. So, so instead of talking about popularity, though, we're going to talk about income and money. And that's why I want Scott Exhibit A, if you would be so kind. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, with the sunglasses, too. So here are all the kinds of pets that Americans own. And okay. what I want you to do yes. is to order them from... Uh, the incomes of their owners, from oh. the highest income to the lowest income. I'm going to put horse as the highest, absolutely. Okay. Because uh, those are expensive. I'm going to put bunny rabbit at the end. Um, toucan? Is that actually a toucan? Well, or is it, 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 it represents birds, bird. Yeah. Okay. Snake. Um, I'm going to put snake at the bottom, actually. I don't know why. This is just based on nothing. Um, I bet you dog people actually have quite a bit of money. Um so, so th this it. is not just rabbits. This is small animals, by the way. Oh. And this isn't just snakes. This is all reptiles. Reptiles. I'm putting. I'm still putting reptiles. Uh, but you have to feed them live things, which is a little more difficult. I'm going to put rodents down here. Rodents. I I love. Oh, but don't call a rabbit a rodent. Oh. That's messed up. Okay. Well, it includes gerbils and everything. I I, I had a gerbil. I was. Okay, so we're that. going horse, dog, cat, bird, reptiles, small animals. Um, you're right on the horse. Uh oh. Interestingly, it actually goes horse, bird, bird, um, then dog, then small animals. Okay. Then cats. Then reptiles. Ah, actually, I I see that case. Oh, that's a nice little ascending. It's an ascending triangle there. L a little technical analysis. Um, and. Uh, so, so that's the income order. There are other interesting demographic facts in this report, by the way. Would you be surprised to learn that um, the owners of cats and reptiles have lower rates of marriage than the overall population? I am not surprised. Me neither. Um, so let's get back to horses, though, because they are our next knock-on effect. My theory is that since they are owned by people with the highest incomes, as the rich get richer, more people are liable to buy horses. Huh. Um, they're incredibly... They're, they're owned by the highest income for a reason. They're incredibly expensive to maintain. You have to get them a lot of land. Um, and just just the costs are, are completely out of whack. You're going to have people looking for uh, more victory gallops. Yeah, so well, that's the other thing, by the way. A callback is the as the racehorses, you know, racehorses uh, prices are rising as well. But in terms of recreational horses, like if you wanted to feed a dog for a year, probably cost you about 200 bucks. Horse will cost you $2,000 a year to feed. 
uh, boarding, stable help, each of those over $2,000 a year. And actually, I was, I was talking to someone around, if you want to board a horse near New York City, it'll cost you around $2,000 a month. Ouch. Yeah. Um, and that's before we get into all the, the horse accoutrement, if you will. Oh, fantastic. So there are you know, saddles and bridles and helmets that are all very expensive. Uh, there are, th this, which has been on the desk, is actually a, believe it or not, is a salt lick. Oh. It's an extremely fancy salt lick, though, uh, made from Himalayan sea salt uh, made in Vermont. So ah. this is like fancier than the salt that humans so use. Like like really for, for fancy horses. Yeah, and then we also have exhibits uh, B and C, if you would be so kind, Scott. Um, these are all things that I bought literally a block from here at a place called Manhattan Saddlery. Oh my God. Uh, this is a uh, sweat wiper that uh, if you wash a horse, you're supposed to take off the sweat. This this I really like. This is a fly guard. Oh my god! This is really expensive. So this is this is for all these uh, bougie horses. Yes, this is a, for the Manhattan horses, if you will. Um, this is to kind of keep the flies off of uh, oh, off of your uh, head. That's good color for you. And this is a horse pick. That's right. And I recognized that I was I was thinking that this looked like something for a horse or like the hooves. That's right. So so before you before or after you uh, ride your horse. You got to pick out the the dirt. I feel like I'm starting to give a tutorial, like a like a home improvement thing. But you pick out the dirt and then you brush it away. I'm actually experienced in this. Are you? I did this as a kid. Yeah, I would uh, sweep horse poop and I'd pick their shoes. Did you own a horse? I did not own a horse. I went to stables though. Right, so very I'm, nice. I'm skilled in in horseback riding. Very good. So that's we've we've uh, unfortunately already we've arrived because higher stock prices, oh. more income inequality, more horses, yes. and more people picking the feet, specifically hose of the feet, of uh, the horses they own. Ah. So do you see, have we already seen sales of horses going up? You know what? Here's the problem. <laughs> um, horse sales, ho horses are dealing with a big economic problem. Mm. Uh, U.S. horse ownership probably peaked in the first decade of the 20th century <laughs> uh, before something called the car became very uh, popular. Yes. Um, and as Amer more Americans move to cities, horse ownership has fallen dramatically. But I've actually, and, and actually, by the way, the sort of bolstering my point, the, the recession was very, very bad for horse ownership. Since horses are, are almost like yacht boats, they're like a, a, a really discretionary thing that you might yes. buy, right? A the last thing you might good. buy. Yeah. Yes. And so I've seen predictions that horse uh, ownership trails the overall stock market by about three years. Ah. So since stocks have been rising, horse ownership might go up on the margins again. And yes. as I always say, the show could be called on the margins because in the long run, I'm not betting on, on people, Amer like a lot of Americans owning horses anytime soon, yeah. no matter how high stocks rise. I wonder if there's a way you could trade this, like maybe investing in like horse shops. Yeah, I mean, th this place Manhattan Saddlery was doing, was doing good business. Uh, but I mean, th there's, you know, a lot of people are caring for their horses. Horse dental care has been oh. very popular. So veterinary cares. Uh, yeah. yeah. But actually I would say that all pets are, a lot of pets are luxury items. And so in that case, veterinarians would do quite oh, well. Well, this guy's not an item. I mean, look how cute. Oh, this, he's this, so cute. Um, but yes, I, 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 that's completely true. And, and millennials, you know, I, I joke that I made that joke about kids, but in all seriousness, as millennials put off having kids, a lot of people with double incomes are just, you know, adopting a dog. A lot of more and more dogs and cats are sleeping in beds with their owners. And so people are just paying more and more for their pets. They see it as part of the family and veterinary bills and vet and all, the, all these sorts of veterinary yeah. medicines. Um, it, it's actually a really hot field right now. Huh. That's interesting. Roger, uh, you, you strike me as someone who might have picked the, the foot of a horse every now and then. Uh, there, are, there are more than enough young people on the estate uh, who will do that for me, so I don't need to get my hands dirty, fortunately. Um, you, you, are, are you, in all seriousness, do you, uh, do you own horses? Do you, have you ever owned a horse? No, surprisingly, given that this is the county that uh, has the headquarters of English horse racing up at Newmarket, and this is also the land of the Suffolk Punch, um, it's very rare that you'll ever see me on a horse, and in fact, I'd probably fall off if they went at any pace, so I try and avoid them. But I do want to I do want to back this up a little bit uh, and look at the bigger picture here Please. because uh, what you do bring up is a very important point, which is income inequality, and that's something that, as we mentioned before, the Fed has in some ways exacerbated. 
Um, you can make that claim at least. And that's something that the Fed's going to have to come to terms with at some point. Um, because, you know, what are the consequences? We've had this massive stimulus that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, we've had really low rates. Um, and so what are the implications of that that we haven't fully realized yet? And so this is going to come in so many different forms. I mean, you know, the horse is a, a wonderful example of, of this, but there's a lot of other um, things that we're going to start to see uh, and policies that we're going to have to start to uh, come to terms with in the near future. And, and I think the key question around income inequality in the Fed is, has, have the Fed's actions of um, making rates lower than they, they would have been otherwise, has that directly helped the stock market, which helped the economy, or has that helped the economy, which helps the stock market? I need and, to say a little bit of both. Of course. Yes. But but that's, that's really what you have to negotiate, is that... Is this basically just another boon for the wealthy, just like um, just like tax cuts, or is this something that you know it, it helps out everyone? So obviously, and any policy that helps the economy is going to help the wealthy disproportionately. Uh, well, I shouldn't say any because you could you could imagine um, you know just handing out five hundred dollars to everybody, but but most policies. So figuring that out is actually really important for how we assess the job the Fed has done over the past decade, I think. Yeah. Well, I think if we're absolutely honest, the intention when Bernanke set out down this route of, of inflating the stock market, he genuinely thought it was going to benefit a large number of people. But unfortunately, it just didn't work out that way. We've very clearly seen that the wealthy have got wealthier. Um, and in the same way that they probably intended to create inflation, but didn't, they probably created deflation of, of all things apart from asset prices. I think that intention to create an inflation of wages, an inflation of, of wealth effect from higher stock markets, it just didn't work out. But the intention was good, but the actual finished product was left wanting. Yeah, it's bad for the snake owner and good for the, good for the horse owner. But uh, before we ride off into the sunset here, Justine, uh, you, you are bringing us our new segment. Yes, we have a new segment today, and it's called What's Your Number? 914. No, I don't want your number. Great. No, thank you. Our special number today is the number four. Okay. Okay, and it's, this is actually about the case of the missing four. So there are missing fours in earnings reports. And so the mystery is, why is this? Okay, so I also want to make the case that a missing four in an earnings report um, from companies, specifically in earnings per share, uh, means that this is a company that you probably want to stay away from. Okay? okay. So a lot of this is based on this paper. It's a paper called Quadrophobia. Love the name. Strategic Rounding of EPS Data. It's quite, quite a beautiful name. Um, and so basically what these researchers did was they looked at over 25,000 companies between the years 1980 and 2013. And they found that, quote, underrepresentation of the number four in the first post-decimal digit of EPS data was apparent, or this is also what they call quadrophobia. So let me break that all down. Please. Okay. So basically, for example, if you have earnings per share and it's 13.4 cents, you would then, it would get rounded to 13 cents. That's what you would report. Okay. But if you have earnings per share of 13.5 cents, that gets rounded up to 14 cents. Oh my God. So a lot of companies have a pretty strong incentive uh -huh. to- Because just by one tenth of a penny. One tenth of a penny, just to change that, to get that up to 0.5 so that they can round up. Wow. And so if they have 0.3, they're not necessarily gonna try to get it to 0.5, but if they have 0.4, oh there's a God. huge incentive just to get that tenth of a cent up to 0.5 so that you can round up. And they actually found that the more coverage, the more scrutiny that there is on a stock, the more likely, more analyst coverage, the more likely they are to have missing fours in their earnings reports. So as a naive person, I might ask, uh, how is it possible you could add a tenth of a penny on earnings? Oh, there's- is, Isn't the whole quarter done? Isn't, aren't we just, just- There's always ways. I mean, this is, it's, this gets into the great accounting practices. Uh -huh. There's always ways. It's not fudging the numbers. These are all, it's all true. It's all accurate. But you know, maybe there were some expenses that you push over to the next quarter. Or maybe there's something that you do and, and you, you can kind of, there's a little bit of uh, what I like to call fudge room. And actually, before I get into this, I do want to bring up a chart. So okay. we actually have a chart here. Um, and this shows you the representation in earnings per share of the amount of how often 
uh, force come up in earnings reports, EPS reports. And you can see that the band is where is normal. And you can see it's pretty much since the 1980s, it's been well below that band. Wow. Okay. But now I want to get into what they call a quadrophobia score. Okay. So these researchers gave every single company the score based on how phobic they are of the number four. And they actually found that it was associated with other issues with accounting practices. So the more likely a firm was to uh, leave out a four, uh -huh. just to try to like, change its numbers to get it up to a 0.5, uh -huh. um, the more likely they were to engage in other uh, fraudulent issues. So let me, I'll have a quote here. Uh, Companies with high quadrophobia scores are, quote, significantly more likely to restate their financial statements, be named as defendants in SEC accounting and auditing enforcement releases, and be involved in class action securities fraud litigation. So this is, I mean, so if you start noticing that a company hasn't reported a 13.4 in any of their earnings uh, EPS statements, it could be a sign of, of other issues. Are there are there companies today that uh, fall into these this bucket? Not there, to call are, anyone out, but. there are historical examples. So this is not necessarily the case today, but the Wall Street Journal actually did a really lovely investigation. Okay. And they found that Dell, between mm -hmm. uh, 1988, which is when they first went public, yeah. and 2006, didn't have a single four in the tenth place of their earnings. Between what, 1988 and And, and 2006. And, and the likelihood- Only 16, it's, the li what do you mean? The, li the, the likelihood of this happening by random chance yeah. was one in 2,500. Wait, but, okay. So I, that's that's unlikely. So so there, it's from, it's a period of almost 20 years? Yes. They didn't have- So it's, it's one, one number out of 10 doesn't come up in 20 years? Uh, it could happen. Uh, it's on every quarterly earnings report. Oh, every quarter. Yes. Quarter. Thank so you. So that's very, very, yes. very unlikely. Thank you. Anyway, so then um, also the SEC, they had to pay $100 million to settle SEC charges that they misled investors. This was in 2010. But four is unlucky in China. Maybe, maybe they just didn't want to, to, you know, spook some people. Ah, it is an unlucky number. Um, but Maybe it's unlucky a little... for, for a reason because you have to round down. Yeah. Raja, what do you make of this? There's clearly been a lot of crafty accounting going on over the years in most walks of life. But at the end of the day, it doesn't sound too bad, does it? A tenth of a cent here or a tenth no. of a cent there? I'm not that yeah, worried. Yeah, right. It's like, it's, and that's what it comes down to. They're not doing anything illegal. But now the SEC is actually... Well, they are if they're moving forward expenses for revenue that they should have booked this quarter. I mean... Eh. Things are... A lot of the companies that do this are doing it by the books, I mean, again, it's, it doesn't take that much to make a tenth of a cent difference. Yeah. But it is now become a signal for the SEC to investigate a company. Yes. And anyway, so that's that does it for uh, this week's What's Your Number? All right, nine one, no. No. Okay, uh, yes, and that also does it for the knock-on effect this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a new episode every Thursday on Real Vision. We also uh, address these topics in somewhat longer and, and banterier uh, uh, effect in our weekly podcast. You can find that on your podcast app under Real Vision Presents. And if you want more on the markets and the economy, make sure you check out realvision.com slash knock on effect where you can sign up for your 14 day free trial. Yeah, plenty of good stuff there. Plenty of new trade ideas, plenty of deeper dives into the economy, markets, all that good stuff. So check it out. Yeah. See you guys next week. You want to try the salt lick? <laughs> <laughs>